Okay, and we are recording. So hi everybody, today's lecture is going to proceed a bit differently. Um, I am actually recording this session live. Um, and so there are some people listening to this live and you may hear people's voices because I will be leaving time for questions. But this lecture is a live review presentation basically and it's going to outline the format of the exam and recap a number of the most important topics from the different units we've had. This class is quite broad, I will acknowledge that. And one thing I hope that comes from this review presentation is that you might be able to notice some connections you didn't spot before or at least solidify them. Um, and what I'm, when I say that, I mean like terms that potentially show up both say during the geography unit and then later during the, um, during the paleontology and fossils unit. You might be able to see some places where terms come up, um, make connections between, for example, in your head, like the, the circulation and latitude related reasons for Antarctica being so cold now thinking about how that's changed over time like what's been what's been what's been present what's been present in the past and what hasn't been Antarctica has always been at a high latitude well not always been but for a long time it's been at a high latitude and if it's that if it's at a high latitude it's going to be affected by the tilt of earth's axis but the circumpolar current has not always existed so it had a very different climate in the in the past that's just one example, but I am hoping that this presentation might play some role in helping the class to feel a little bit less random. Um, so astoundingly, we are actually more than, we are about halfway through the class now. Um, and this is kind of the point at which it, afterwards it becomes harder to catch up if you're really behind on assignments or missing lots of labs, or if the materials, <clears throat> or if you're falling back on the material. Um, and I will say that if there is a COVID related hardship that you haven't told me or your TAs about yet, um, do that before the exam is due because it's, we're approaching the point where it's, we're gonna be having less and less time for class and it's gonna be harder and harder to get caught up. Um, looking ahead, there is a reading assignment that is due um, on Sunday the 14th, Valentine's Day, hilariously. <laughs> Um, but that is the news article write up and you don't necessarily have to worry about that before you take the midterm, but it is basically the next thing that's going to come up afterwards. Um, and there is also a lab this week. Do not, um, don't make sure that you take the time to look over that and submit that before Friday or before midnight at Friday, uh, before midnight on Friday is what I meant to say. Um, and that is the Rocks of Antarctica lab. Um, and that is about all I'm going to talk about stuff aside from the midterm, because this is the midterm review session. So the midterm is open now, and it's going to remain open until Sunday, February 7th at 11.59 p.m. It is basically a long quiz, very much like the one you took before, except that there are not going to be any short answer questions this time. It's going to be 50 multiple choice and true or false questions. There's 10 on each page, so it's five pages that you go through. Um, and you have the amount of time to complete it that you would normally have if this were being offered as an in-person class. 75 minutes. Um, if one has DSPS accommodations, I have already I have already incorporated that in. If there's um, anything I should know about that isn't already in the DSPS system, please send me a message ASAP so I can set that up. But um, you can begin your attempt at any time, but you want to make sure you don't do it too close to the due date. I don't recommend starting this at 11 o'clock on Sunday, 11 p.m. on Sunday, February 7th, unless you're really confident that you can get it done really quickly. And even then that's that's taking unnecessary risks. Um, so you get one single attempt to do it. So I would suggest taking the time you can to study and especially make sure that you've seen or at least read the slides and notes for lecture eight, which was the most recently released lecture of new material on Monday. Um, and if you run into an issue with the internet failing in the middle of when you're taking the exam or if a life event happens like you just have to leave your house for some reason um, please email me asap so we can figure a workaround out um don't wait don't wait don't don't wait on that we can i understand stuff happens and if you explain it to me there's a good chance i can i can straighten things out um so this exam is closed notes and closed book so we don't really have a textbook but the material comes from the slides and from the study guide and from the videos so don't be looking at or watching any of those while you're taking the exam. The idea is that you've studied and solidified as much as you can what I've gone blah, blah, blah about all semester or all quarter so far. And then it's time for you to try to 
it's time for you to remember that as best you can. So no notes when you're taking the exam. Also, um, don't do not talk to your friends or anyone in the class while you're doing it. And in general, I would actually pe prefer that people just not discuss the exam at all until I say otherwise. And the reason I'm being so uh, blunt about that is because I have a feeling through a variation of a variety of circumstances, just with everything going on, there will be some people who are still taking the exam next week. Um, do not anticipate being able to do that. Again, this is just me saying that there's a very good chance some people will need to. Um, and I don't want to have people talking about the exam until I'm sure that everyone who's going to take it has taken it. Um, so um, you should be able to know how, you should be able to see specific feedback and know more about how well you've done on the exam sometime later next week, but not immediately. Um, and the next lecture of new material will roll out on Monday, February 8th, when we are going to stop to start talking about glaciers. So that's going to, that's going to, that's going to be when we shift to material that is going to be more heavily co covered on the final. I will say that the final looking forward will be cumulative. So once you've taken this test, don't throw your notes out, don't throw the study guide out. Um, I mean, you can always download it. But, um, I apologize. Could you possibly mute that just so that it doesn't disrupt the recording? I don't know who that is. Thank you very much. Sorry to be sorry to be sorry about that. Um, um, so anyhow, um, but my point was that the midterm, the final exam will be cumulative. It will be mostly based on material from glaciers onward, but but material from this exam will show up again. Um, okay, I am going to see participants. Um, I am going to mute everybody. Just I'm going to mute everybody. So you may unmute yourself, but I there was just some background noise coming in that was disrupting the recording. So I'm I'm sorry to do that. But if you do want to ask a question verbally, you can unmute yourself. Um, actually, does anyone have questions about, does anyone who's here have questions about, um, about, this is kind of the similar stuff, but about just general exam info before I move on? If we, like, complete the study guide at, let, let's say, like, Thursday and still have, like, some questions, is it okay to, like, email you still then? Yes, that's a fantastic point. Yes, you may email me anytime. I will do my best to answer emails on the weekend, and um, if one wants to make an appointment with me to meet after this, like on Thursday or Friday, I can't guarantee that I'll be able to make it. But if you let me know ahead of time enough, I can probably manage something. So yes, yes. And really, you can always email me anytime with questions. As long as you're not like in the middle of the exam emailing me, that's that's not good. Don't be doing that. But if you haven't taken the exam yet, yes. Um, other questions? I don't see anything in chat. So the material itself is going to be drawn from the lectures as um, which are the videos like this one, as well as the slides that accompany them. And I will say that if you can open the slides in PowerPoint, they have the notes that I lecture from. And if you cannot watch or if you, if you, I, I hope that by this point, you've been able to watch every video at least once, but if you're trying to review the lectures and you don't have time to watch the whole video and you don't wanna be scrolling through it, the PowerPoint version does have notes on each slide that are a good approximation of what I say in the videos and a good approximation of what the main points of each slide are, as well as how concepts um, just kind of put up there on the slide relate to other concepts we've talked about in class and kind of what the big picture is and how I'm relating this to Antarctic science in general. Um, I also want you to make sure that you've caught up on any articles and video clips I've had you watch. Um, don't spend lots of time on them, studying them or revealing them, I will say. Um, just make sure that you've read the paleontology articles and the climate articles and seen the clips of Frozen Planet, Walking with Dinosaurs and March of the Penguins that I assigned. Um, note that on Gaucho Space, for a couple of those, it tells you what part you actually need to watch. Um, I noticed that some people um, on the midterm, uh, there was a question asking about adaptations in Frozen Planet and some people, some people answered referring to something about seals earlier in the movie, which was, a part about the Arctic that I didn't assign. And I, I told the TAs just to still give credit for that because it's technically true, but you don't need to watch the entire movie. And also 
don't spend time on that at the expense of the exam, at the expense of studying the lecture material, because they, the articles and the video clips are kind of there to reinforce important concepts that will very likely show up on the exam, like um, how penguins stay warm, or the southern lights, or um, Australia's relationship with Antarctica, like the polar dinosaur community that lived in Australia and Antarctica, as well as the fact that Australia and Antarctica were attached so much for their geologic history. The Walking with Dinosaurs clip is there to kind of reinforce that. Um, the study guide contains key, key, the key terms contained within the lecture slides, and it basically has the all but certain topics that you're going to see on the test. The study guide, the, the terms and the concepts on the study guide are the concepts that I'm going to test you on. And they're all taken directly from the slides. The study guide is just kind of a way to see the key terms without having to dig through all the pictures and any just fun examples I give or digressions or, or whatnot. Um, so the material covered from the lectures is lecture, oh, excuse me, is lecture two, which is the geography of Antarctica. So both the human and the physical geography. We learned about stuff like the physical shape of Antarctica, important features like the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, the difference between East and West Antarctica. And then I introduced some statistics like why is Antarctic, like Antarctica being the coldest continent, the driest continent, the windiest continent, and the highest con continent on average. And now that you're further along in the course, you know a lot more about the whys for all of those things. Um, you know, we've studied, we've gone over the fact that Antarctica is a high pressure zone and that's part of why it's so windy. You get the combination of falling air at the poles and then the dome shape of the glaciers causes air to be able to just flow downhill and gain speed and flow out towards the coast. And Antarctica has really strong winds because of that. And also because you have the wind blowing through the Southern Ocean. Um, but we learned we learn about why Antarctica is so cold later. And it's worth studying some of the older slides, even if you have even if you feel pretty solid with them. Now that you have the knowledge that you've gained further along in the class, more knowledge about climate, more knowledge about Antarctica's geologic history. And the same thing will happen when we get to glaciers um, in the second half of the course. We haven't really gone gone over glaciers and ice out, out much outside of their importance to um, to Antarctic bottom water formation or their importance to krill. But we'll talk more about glaciers and sea ice during the next part of the course. Um, but lecture three is all about climate and kind of an introduction to how air circulates. Um, so, oh, actually, one thing I forgot to mention is that for geography, we also learned a bit about the small human presence um, and where the main research, the main United States research bases are. And when talking about climate subsequently, um, we talked about how climate is related to atmospheric and oceanic circulation and how those are those play a big role in keeping Antarctica as cold and as dry and as windy as it is. We moved on to geology um, for lecture five. We talked about plate tectonics, how you have different types of plate boundaries surrounding Antarctica. And then we went way back in time, first talking about fossils and the rock record. And we basically then went into a highlights reel of some interesting geologic events that have occurred in Antarctica as well as the world, like Snowball Earth and the Antarctic coal swamps and the dinosaurs that lived in Antarctica, and on to the opening of the gateways and the formation of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, which turned Antarctica into a place where there's very little terrestrial ecology. There's only some very, there's only some sur sparse surviving arthropods and, and primitive plants. Um, and that was the end of lecture seven, seven B, the most recent lecture of new material um, is all about the marine life of Antarctica. So ecology, autotrophs and heterotrophs, trophic levels, um, predation, and then how some of the specific organisms in Antarctica fit into that, into that, like Antarctic krill, phytoplankton, penguins, and we learned a little bit about how penguins stay warm, seals, whales, etc. So that's a summary of what we've covered so far this term in a nutshell. Does anybody have questions so far about these last couple of slides? Okay, I'm not hearing or seeing anything in the chat. So I'm going to move on to what are going to be sort of summaries of important topics from the different units we've done. I'm going to say that 
what I am saying in the presentation today is not necessarily exhaustive regarding what's going to be on the exam, but I'm going to try to at least touch, I'm going to at least try to mention as many of the important concepts as possible. And there's a good chance that if you're watching this and there's concepts I bring up in here um, and you don't understand what I'm talking about, then it's definitely worth going back to where that is in the slides and studying that before you take the exam. So let's start with geography because that's the that's where we started introducing new material. Lecture one, which is all intro stuff, is not on this exam at all. So don't worry about that. But in the geography unit, we learned about how Antarctica is the coldest continent, the driest continent, the windiest continent, and the highest continent, at least on average for a couple of these. There are drier places on Earth, like the Atacama Desert in Chile, but as a whole, Antarctica is really, really dry. The entire continent of Antarctica gets very, very little rain as a whole. There's very little parts of Antarctica that you would consider wet. What little snow is there accumulates very slowly and just kind of has time to build up. And Antarctica is the highest continent on average because the glaciers cover valleys and sort of smooth everything out, meaning that what goes into the average is the high elevations of the glaciers. Whereas in Asia, which is the continent where Mount Everest, the actual highest single point on Earth is. Um, and remember that the Himalayas are one of the examples we have of continent-continent collision causing mountain building, a convergent boundary causing continental collision. And we have had that in Antarctica in the past, but that's not going on there now. But either way, Asia is not nearly as high on average because it has low-lying regions that cancel out the Himalaya and Mount Everest. Um, Antarctica, because there's the big ice cover, that's why it's so high. But the, in terms of why Antarctica is so dry, why it's so cold, and why it's so windy, well, we learned that that's a consequence of Antarctica's latitude, the fact that it's at a latitude where it doesn't get much direct sunlight, um, and also where the tilt of the Earth's axis puts it in complete darkness for part of the year. And then when we got to climate, we learned about how oceanic and atmospheric circulation create the high pressure that makes the winds and also creates the winds in the Antarctic circumpolar current in the Southern Ocean that both keep the ocean windy and also help keep the, keep the continent cold itself. And geography, we did introduce the concept of the, the, we did introduce the concepts of latitude and longitude and maps. So you do want to remember that latitude is going to tell you, latitude is going to tell you how north or south you are compared to the equator. And latitude is important because different latitudes, for one thing, they get different amounts of solar radiation, which affects climate. It actually is what causes atmospheric circulation to begin with. And also different latitudes spin at different rates, and that is what causes the Coriolis effect. And then longitude is the similar, the similar vertical lines that tell you how east or west you are of the prime meridian. And the longitude doesn't immediately have as many effects on climate, but um, one thing I briefly touched upon is how like longitude is longitude is kind of like time. Longitude a sing, on a single line of longitude, if a bunch of different people are standing on the same line, they're all going to come to a new day when the Earth is spinning around at the same time, and that's kind of why the different different latitudes have to spin at different rates because. Um, since the equator bulges out more, points on the equator have to spin a lot faster to come back around at the same time as points at the pole, where it bulges out much less. Like if you're on one of the lines of latitude by the pole, it's kind of a smaller circle. But anyway, um, when I say high latitudes, that's referring to the fact that Antarctica is close to the South Pole, which is 90 degrees south. Low latitudes refer to the equator, high latitudes refer to the poles. Um, and a lot of the lecture then went into important geographic features of Antarctica, like the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, the East and West Antarctic ice sheets, and their separate uh, East versus West Antarctica, and the East Antarctic and Western Antarctic ice sheets, which we'll talk more about in detail when we get to glaciers later in the term. Um, the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, the geographic South Pole, the magnetic South Pole, and the difference between those two, the fact that the magnetic South Pole actually wanders because Earth's magnetic field is unstable. Um, and the human geography that we focused on, you definitely want to know where the main US bases are, where the three United States research bases are. McMurdo on Ross Island, um, in the Ross Sea over here, which is the biggest settlement on Antarctica by far. 
and then Ammons and Scott base at the South Pole. The US has a base at the South Pole itself, and then Palmer Station up in the peninsula. Um, and it's worth knowing things like what's what's interesting about the peninsula. It's the warmest part of Antarctica. It's the farthest north part, and it's the closest to any other continent. So I talk a little bit about how that's it's actually nearest the part where the Antarctic circumpolar current um, flows fastest because it's being kind of squeezed by the closeness of the Antarctic Peninsula and um, South America. But the Antarctic is now completely separated from other continents, and that's why the Antarctic Circumpolar Current even exists and continues to keep Antarctica cold. And I'll actually have a slide on the Circumpolar Current later um, after geology to kind of tie together how it shows up in several different parts of the course. Does anybody have any geography questions that they've wanted to ask before I move on? I'm not hearing anything and I'm not seeing anything in chat, so I'm going to continue on to climate. So climate covers two lectures, lectures three and four, and it began with a fair bit of intro material. We talked about solar radiation and how the solar radiation that reaches Earth is unevenly distributed because the sunlight hits the equator head on. The equator gets direct sunlight, whereas since the pole is very heavily curved, the solar radiation reaching the pole is kind of spread out, which is why the polar sun is felt more weakly. If you're actually in Antarctica, the sunlight feels weaker, and it's, it is. It's more spread out. Um, and we then moved on to talking about the greenhouse effect and how that keeps Earth warm and the structure of the atmosphere. And that created an opportunity for me to add some Antarctica specific concepts, like how the southern lights are formed in the thermosphere, the out, one of the, outer, the outermost part of the atmosphere where Earth's magnetic field interacts with um, charged particles from outer space, um, as well as the Antarctic ozone hole, which is a hole in the ozone that is in the stratosphere, the layer, um, kind of the second layer of the atmosphere, and how, for example, ozone depletion is so pronounced in Antarctica because the chemicals that cause ozone depletion, like CFCs and the nitrogen oxide compounds, they are long lived and they accumulate in Antarctica because of the polar vortex, um, the winds around Antarctica trapping them during the winter, and the fact that the chemical reactions that destroy ozone brought about by these CFCs and by these nitrogen oxide compounds, those reactions are enabled by cold weather. So as a consequence of that, Antarctica has been, Antarctica has been the center of ozone depletion and it was, it was the Antarctic ozone hole that prompted the Montreal Protocol, which was the, um, which was the, the law, the international law that was put in place to phase out the uses of CFCs and to make also make make jet fuel a bit cleaner because the jet fuel is where the nitrogen oxide compounds were coming from and it's cited often as a potential um blueprint for phasing out um use of fossil fuels um but anyhow after the ozone layer um and kind of moving on from the structure of the atmosphere we went directly into why antarctica is so cold so i mentioned the latitude effect in the sunlight you also have the fact that Antarctica is um, tilted away. So because Earth is tilted on its axis during the part um, for part of the year, Antarctica is, since it's literally at the end of the Earth, is going to be pointing straight away from the sun. The sun is, the sunlight is simply not going to reach Antarctica for part of the year. And that's actually how the Antarctic Circle is defined. The Antarctic Circle is the latitude below which the, any land south of the Antarctic Circle will experience at least one day of total darkness per year and at least one day of 24 hour daylight per year. Um, and something we'll get to more when we get to climate change is that Earth's axial tilt changes over time. Um, you do want to be familiar with the term Milankovitch cycle, which comes up during the um, which comes up during the climate lectures, just referring to general general cyclical changes in Earth's orbit and Earth's axial tilt and the direction of Earth's wobble that are a long-term player in terms of climate. Um, but you want to be able to understand how an excess of solar radiation and thus an excess of energy at the equator 
leads ultimately to atmospheric circulation, that energy is transferred by the wind via convection um, away from the equator and towards the poles. And even though, as you see, the there isn't a direct transfer of air from the equator to the poles, these three different cells do ultimately have the effect of using air to transfer energy that's piling up at the equator to the poles. Um, so atmospheric circulation exists in the first place because when there's an excess of something at one, in one place, it will form a gradient and move to the place where there's less of it. And even though it kind of makes some stops like air, air the air itself is going, to, is going to get too cold and fall before it gets all the way to the pole, it still allows for energy transfer because energy gets transferred from one circulation cell to the next. Um, and that does help bring that does help bring energy and warmth to Antarctica. Um, but one interesting consequence of it, um, Antarctica and the Arctic are both in zones where air from a circulation cell is falling. And that is what causes high pressure. That air is also going to be dry because that air will have lost any moisture in it at the latitude that it rose at. Because at the latitude that it rose at, once the air got high enough in the atmosphere, it became too cold to hold hold much water anymore and the water fell out as rain. So Antarctica is kind of on the reverse end of that. Antarctica is where the dry air is falling. Dry, very cold air. And because there's not much sunlight in Antarctica, it stays cold when it's on the ground. Um, and that actually factors into how we get the catabatic winds, the pressure winds or the drainage winds that form at the center of the continent where you have the cold air falling in the high pressure zone. And because of the dome shape of Antarctica, that air then accelerates as it begins to head outward. And that leads to really strong winds towards the edges of the continent, like in the dry valleys actually, which are as free of ice as they are because the catabatic winds blow so strongly through them that they blow any ice that can accumulate away. Um, and the, and you want to know what I mean about high versus low pressure. Low pressure is where air is rising. High pressure is where air is falling. And Antarctica is a high pressure zone. Um, the, we talked about ocean circulation also and how wind causes surface ocean currents like the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and also how Ekman transport um, will can cause winds blowing around, blowing from the north to create a current that goes west to east around the continent. And we'll get more to that in a different slide. Um, and I have another slide also that delves into Antarctic bottom water and how that plays a role in deep ocean circulation. Um, and I'll linger on that a bit. But I'm going to do also a quick review of the Coriolis effect first, because that um, affects how circulation happens. It is a product of, um, let's see, I'm just going to get, get my face out of this. It is, a, it is a product of the fact that Earth is a globe, that Earth is all spinning in one direction, and that you have different parts of the globe, different parts of the sphere spinning at different speeds. And when I say different parts, I mean different latitudes, namely that at the equator, it's spinning fastest, and at the poles, it's spinning slow, slowest. So for the Coriolis effect, I like to focus on this, this, it's a bit hand wavy, but this concept of spinning velocity. And what you want to remember is that as we are standing on the ground, we are traveling with the Earth. We don't register it because the Earth is moving relatively slowly, all things considered, but we are where we are, wherever we are in the Earth, whether it's me in California or um, you and wherever your house is, you are traveling with the Earth at whatever latitude you are at. You are spinning at the same rate as the bit as the latitude of the earth you are standing on is and not all latitudes spin at the same rate the equator spins much faster than the poles and what that means is that if something like an airplane takes off at the equator and heads towards the poles it will be traversing latitudes that are going slower and the key thing is that an airplane if the pilot doesn't correct for this will retain the spinning velocity of the latitude of the land it took off from and the same is true of the masses of wind involved in atmospheric circulation so if one flies towards the north pole from the equator you will be deflected to the east and that is your right relative to the original direction you were flying in that is your right and you're being deflected that way because the earth is spinning west to east 
And what is essentially happening is that you are overcompensating. You're going a lot faster in the east to west direction, the spinning direction, than the ground underneath you is because you're getting closer to the pole and the ground underneath you is spinning much less quickly than at the equator. Conversely, if you fly from the North Pole to the equator, you are deflected to the west, which is to your right. Once again, it's to the right of the direction you were heading because you're starting from the slow pole and you started at a really slow spinning velocity. But as you head closer and closer to the equator, Earth starts spinning faster and faster west to east still, and you're not really keeping up. You're spinning slowly as if you were still at the North Pole. And so that kind of means you're dragged, well, back towards the west, which is right relative to you. And in the southern hemisphere, what happens if you fly in a plane south from the equator towards the South Pole is that you will once again be going too fast as you get farther from the equator. You'll, you'll be retaining the spinning velocity of the equator and you're going to start drifting to the east because again, Earth is still rotating west to east and you're, you're acting as if you're still spinning west to east as quickly as you would be if you were still on the equator. And this time you are being taken to your left. Being, if you're heading due south, being dragged towards the e being dragged west to east is going to be to the left of your intended direction. And thus, if you fly from the south pole to the equator, you're a going you're going to be dragged to you're going to be dragged east to west. You're going to be um you're going to be at the slow spinning south pole. And as you approach the equator, the land underneath you is going to be spinning faster and faster. And you will kind of going end up going too far west because you're kind of you're kind of not going fast enough. And that will be to the left of your original direction. And this is what I mean when I say to the right and the north, to the left and the south. It's from the vantage point of say the pilot in the plane whose motion is being deflected or if you're say, I don't know, a little insect riding a wind current or something like that. It's one place where I think it does help to anthropomorphize a little bit of things because left and right are terms that only make sense if a point of view is clearly stated and um, establishing the point of view of say the pilot in a plane that's being affected by the Coriolis effect is one way to help you remember which direction you're actually being dragged. And it's important to understand this for atmospheric circulation as well as Ekman transport because during Ekman transport, um, a wind actually causes the water being dragged underneath it by friction to be deflected 90 degrees. And what direction that is, whether it's 90 degrees to the left of the original wind direction or 90 degrees to the right of the original wind direction, that ends up depending on what hemisphere you're in. So I'm gonna pause and ask if anyone has questions about the Coriolis effect or about any of the climate stuff I've alluded to so far. Okay, not hearing or seeing anything. So I'm gonna move on to a summary of Antarctic bottom water. So Antarctic bottom water is involved in thermohaline circulation, which is the type of circulation that involves not wind dragging the water through Ekman transport, but instead water rising or sinking through the water column up and down between the shallow ocean and the deep ocean based on changes in density. Um, changes related to salinity, how salty the water is, and its temperature. So at the poles, the, the picnic line, which is the, the boundary in the ocean, the density separation boundary that masses of water can't cross usually. And with water masses, again, remember that even though we think of it as one big ocean, water can kind of, a distinct part of the ocean can move and there's there's water, there's masses of water that are distinct in terms of their salinity and their temperature and thus their density. And one of those is Antarctic bottom water, which is the main subject of this slide. But anyhow, um, so at the poles, the picnic line is weaker. Weaker polar sunlight caused by the, the latitude um, means that the surface water is fairly cool. And at the equator, normally the surface water is warmed quite a bit by the strong solar radiation, the strong sunlight. And it is significantly warmer than the under the deep water, which is something you'll notice if you dive. The, the water at the surface is warmed by the sun, but, but below 100 meters, um, the sunlight doesn't really penetrate the water at all, and it's cold. At the poles, that is less pronounced. And also the salinity difference is less pronounced. At the equator, the sun 
blasts on the water and evaporates it and the salt gets left behind in the water that remains and that makes the surface water salty, much saltier than the deep water. Um, because of the weak polar sun and because of frequent runoff from glaciers and sea ice, the surface water in general at the poles is less salty. And this is one place where I acknowledge that it can be a bit confusing because I then go on to talk about how Antarctic bottom water stinks because it's more salty. So Antarctic bottom water is kind of like, think about it being kind of like the odd one out that gets away as fast as possible. Because in general, the surface water at the poles is going to be fairly cool and not very salty at all, which is what at least certain times of the year makes it possible for things, including masses of water to actually sink past the picnic line. There's not, there's not a big density separation between the vast majority of the surface water at the pole and the vast majority of the deep water at the pole. But what happens in Antarctica is that the catabatic winds that we talked about, the pressure winds, blow from the Antarctic continent and blow sea ice away from the coast. And that causes water to come up to replace it. That water immediately gets cooled by contact with the air. The latent heat is the water, the water losing heat as it's cooled by the air. And then some of that water freezes. Some of that water freezes and forms more sea ice. And when that happens, the water which has first been cooled by being exposed to the air, the water that's still water ends up being a lot saltier because the newly formed sea ice does not take the salt into it. So what that means is that even though overall the ocean water is a lot less salty and there's very little there's very little in the way of a density difference, right by the coast, a mass of water has formed all of a sudden that is much denser than the surrounding water. That's much, that's very salty and really cold. And it can then sink because the water with the water surrounding it, it's denser than the water surrounding it no matter what. It's denser than the surface water and it's denser than even the water under the surface. Like it's it's denser than even, even most of the water that's below a hundred meters. Um, there basically isn't a picnic line and this new mass of Antarctic bottom water can just sink to the very, very bottom of the ocean then and spread out. So that's, so that's something I think ended up being a point of confusion for a few people because I talk about salinity differences um, and you have to, and I, you need to be careful whether you're talking about salinity differences in kind of the general waters or salinity differences with Antarctic bottom water itself. Because even though the polar water is overall a lot less salty, Antarctic bottom water in particular does get really salty because of the sea ice formation. And that's what actually causes it to sink. And it can sink because the, it can sink because the, the surface ocean water is actually a lot less dense than usual. Um, and this is important because the polar water, the Antarctic polar water, which has been exposed to the atmosphere recently, takes oxygen down to the bottom of the ocean. And marine organisms actually need oxygen to survive also. They obtain it through gills. So it helps oxygenate the oceans as it spreads out in the deep ocean farther away from the continent. And it also carries nutrients down. And those nutrients later upwell elsewhere. Um, and something I didn't linger on much, but I alluded to a little bit with ecology is that there is a similar water mass to this forming in the North Atlantic called North Atlantic deep water, which is also oxygenated and full of nutrients. And that particular water mass actually upwells near Antarctica and helps provide nutrients. So thermohaline circulation in general plays a big role in just moving nutrients throughout the ocean, moving them into the deep ocean, um, mo moving them elsewhere and letting them up well wherever, wherever they can. Um, but Nutrients are a big, nutrients and oxygen distribution is a big consequence of thermohaline circulation. And Antarctic bottom water is actually one of the big providers of nutrients um, and oxygen to the oceans, as it turns out. Um, and where do the nutrients come from? They come from the big productivity boom in the summer. Um, part of what Antarctic bottom water actually does is it helps bring the, it helps bring all of the nutrients that are accumulating during the summer when the phytoplankton are just blooming day and night, literally, to elsewhere in the world, um, including California. That the, the nutrients upwelling in the waters off California, some of them originally came from Antarctic bottom water. Um, that's a bit beyond this class, but I just wanted to bring that up in case people, are, people think that's cool. Um, I will pause for questions before I move on to geology.
I see a chat question. Um, let me just give you, it is, give me a quick second to, I'm going to step out of slideshow mode just so I can see the chat. Zoom is making it really hard for me to look at the chat. I am going to briefly stop the share to see what the chat question is. Okay, starting the screen share again. And I'm going to jump back to where we were. We're finishing with Antarctic bottom water and about to go to geology, but there was a question in chat about whether the exam is going to be sequential. And I think I interpret that correctly as are there going to be questions about geography, then followed by climate, then followed by geology? And the answer is no. The questions from the different subjects will be spread about. Um, so they're not sequential. I tried to, um, on each page, I tried to, I, on, on each page of the exam, I, um, I, um, I sort of spread the subjects of the questions out by like how much material there is on them. So like there's more climate questions than there are geography because we spent about twice as much time on climate, um, but stuff like that. I see someone's raising a hand also. Would you rather chat or do you want to speak up over over Zoom? Hi, uh, yeah, that was me. Um, I was just wondering, so I asked the question, what, by sequential navigation, I meant um, for the questions, like, do they allow you to go back and- Yes, yes, thank you okay. for clarifying. Yes, when you, you can go, you don't have to, when you finish a page, you haven't set that in stone and like committed to it until you actually submit the whole exam, you can go back and change your answers. All right, um, it's just, yeah, it's just, yeah, absolutely. The pages are just kind of meant to uh, make it so it's not just one gigantic wall of questions. Awesome, thank you. Yep, and thanks for clarifying that. Um, other questions about climate or whatnot before I move on? And I think there should be a way to see chat, but when, when I'm doing this, but it's, it's whatever. I'll, I'll, I, I, can, I, can jump, I can jump out if I need to. It's not that big a deal, don't worry. So chat is still fine if you wanna do it that way. Um, so after climate, we made a bit of a shift over to talking about geology. So we talked a little bit about the structure of the earth and how it's made of different tectonic plates made of the rigid lithosphere, which is the um, physically the solid rigid outermost layer of earth. And those float on the asthenosphere, which is the sort of more plasticky solid part of the mantle lying underneath. We went over how fossils and the shapes of continents and the evidence of glaciers and mountain belts indicated that the continents had moved and that subsequently how the discovery of seafloor spreading in which new crust is produced and the discovery then of subduction in which crust is recycled allowed for a mechanism to be discovered and for the theory of plate tectonics to be developed. I talked a little bit about how you have the cycle of ridge push caused by the, caused by the slope, caused by the, the rocks near the mid-ocean ridge being less dense and higher up and the rocks farther away being more dense and push and being both more compact and also sort of weighing down into the asthenosphere more, how that gradient creates a push and also how the subducting slab itself is getting heavier and kind of pulling on things and how there's movement of material in the mantle driving all of this. And we then went into the different plate boundary types and the first of those are divergent plate boundaries like we have at a mid-ocean ridge. So at this mid-ocean ridge, it's dominated by the divergent plate boundaries at the spreading centers themselves. And those are the fissures, these, these lines, these cracks through which magma is actually coming. Um, but because the fissures are staggered like so, um, you can see how they kind of zigzag and between them, there's the segment where earth is moving. Earth is moving on one side of the crack in this direction and on the other side of the crack in this other direction, but there's no magma being made. Those are the transform faults. Um, actually, those are the transform. The transform plate boundaries are these segments between between the fissures, between the volcanoes, between the spreading centers themselves, um, where seafloor spreading is actually causing causing the crust to move in opposite directions on either side of this connector segment, farther out away from the spreading centers, where the geometry causes them to just be moving in the same direction. That's a fracture zone. That's where there is, there was 
breakage caused by the transform fault. Um, something he went over in lab is that these, these segments can change shape. But since the arrows are going in the same direction, the one, on, the one on top of this crack is going to the left, and the one on the bottom of this crack is also going to the left, that's not a plate boundary. That's the fracture zone. Um, but so one of the types of plate boundaries, um, divergent plate boundaries, is often found alongside one of the other types, transform boundaries. Um, the largest transform boundary is the San Andreas Fault near where California is located. And that's a case where you have movement like this occurring on land instead and on and over a much, much longer segment. The San Andreas Fault is basically this, but covering but the entire length of the entire state of California. And funnily enough, um, there is an ocean spreading center north of California in the North Pacific Ocean that is one end of this connector segment. And then there are spreading centers in the Gulf of California south of us that are another spreading center. So the San Andreas Fault running through California is connecting to divergent plate boundaries like this, just over a much, much, much greater distance, which I think is really cool. Um, but that kind of plays into how the Atlantic Ocean originally formed which for the, the Atlantic Ocean formed when Pangaea began to break up. And actually, Antarctica also separated from the southern continents as Pangaea began to break up, something we talk about more during the um, something we talk about more during the kind of Earth history of Antarctica section. I like this animation because it does a nice job of how of showing how subduction and seafloor spreading are balanced. You can see that as the as seafloor spreading is occurring, subduction is occurring over here, and the Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger, while the Pacific Ocean is getting smaller. Actually, that is true to this day. The Pacific Ocean is getting smaller, um, and the reason the Pacific Ocean, the countries surrounding it, are the Ring of Fire, the, the Pacific Ocean is to a big extent surrounded by subduction trenches, and it's being squeezed as the as as the continents surrounding the Atlantic Ocean are being pushed farther and farther apart. Um, what you want to remember is that the plate boundary stays out in the ocean. This is a really good illustration of how the plate boundaries themselves, they might move a little bit, but they, they kind of stay out here and they continue to push, make more oceanic crust and push the continents further apart. So out on the coastlines of Brazil and Angola and the other countries of Western Africa, those are now what's known as a passive margin. The plate boundary isn't along Guinea-Bissau or Namibia today or alongside Uruguay, it's way out in the Atlantic Ocean, still still producing crust and pushing these continents farther and farther apart to this day. And that's true in Antarctica as well. The coastline of Antarctica is really far from the actual spreading center out in the Southern Ocean where that has been developing oceanic crust and pushing Antarctica away from Africa and pushing Antarctica away from Australia all this time. Um, so the only volcanoes we have in Antarctica today on the actual continent itself are hotspots. I mentioned how some volcanoes can occur separately from plate boundaries when you have mantle material sort of rises through the plate boundary and just stays in a given spot, just pumping out um, magma while the, plate bound while the plates move on top of it. And that's what caused Mount Erebus. So Mount Erebus is not actually at a plate boundary, it's a hotspot. Um, so we do have at least we do have some active volcanoes in Antarctica, but hotspot volcanoes, not those caused at plate boundaries. Um, and I do go over hotspots briefly in the geology lecture also. Um, now, not all crust does subduct. Um, the continents do not. So that's how you got the Himalayas when India and what's now the rest of Asia collided. Um, it's also how Antarctica was built in the first place because um, cratons, the ancient pieces of crust, of continental crust that have been together for a long time. The Eastern Arctic Craton was formed by a series of mountain building events, by mountain chains colliding with one another um, and not being subducted because they couldn't, because the crust that makes up the continents is not dense enough to subduct. But um, the continent-continent collisions are an example of a convergent plate boundary. And if you have two plates containing continental crust, you get collision and mountain building. But if there's any oceanic crust involved, you get subduction, like what's going on in this animation. One plate is subducting under the other. This plate is made of oceanic crust. This one is made of continental crust. It's generating a volcanic arc. So there's volcanoes erupting all in down here. This is the trench itself, like the Marianas Trench. Um, this is happening right now in Antarctica in the subantarctic islands in what's called the Scotia Trench where the trench where the Atlantic plate 
and the Scotia plate, which is one of the little microplates surrounding Antarctica. Um, the Scotia plate is subducting under the Antarctic plate and creating a magmatic arc, which are the subantarctic islands. South Georgia, the South Sandwich Islands, the curve of islands north of the Antarctic Peninsula is a, is a volcanic arc caused by subduction. Um, and actually, there was an earthquake recently in Antarctica that a student was kind enough to point out to me um, uh, during the last review session. And what I think is cool is that that earthquake occurred in the Southern Ocean near the peninsula, and it was from subduction. Um, convergent plate boundaries tend to create really, really big earthquakes because you have a cool downgoing plate that's been, that's been, it's been cold, hard rock for a long time. It's been a very long time since it was first erupted. So it's cold and dense and it's, it's subducting underneath thick and also relatively cold um, continental crust, which isn't as dense, but it's, but it's not as, but it's not as warm. So you get, so you get friction from that. You get a lot of friction when one plate is subducting. And that is one reason why um, you get a lot of big earthquakes in places like Chile and Japan or the Mediterranean Sea, or to a lesser extent in the subantarctic islands, you get big earthquakes there because subduction is occurring. And so the plate boundary discussion and talking about how different plate boundaries show up in Antarctica or in the Southern Ocean surrounding it, um, or instances in which they've occurred in the past. Like I talked about how continental collision isn't happening in Antarctica today, but it happened um, very early on in its history. Um, that background gave way to a summary of first fossils in paleontology, where we, lock, where we learned about relative dating versus absolute dating, how you date some rocks, the, the rocks formed from sediment by looking at their relations to one another and how you can date rocks that used to be magma using radioactivity. Um, and then, we went through how important fossils are for understanding the rock record and how you can have either body fossils of an organism itself or trace fossils of some activity that they left behind, like the stromatolites made by the cyanobacteria that first oxygenated the atmosphere. Um, and we went first from the formation of the East Antarctic Craton, the mountain building event that built Antarctica um, and during which its earliest rocks were deposited, were, were formed 3.8 billion years ago. We went on a tour through Precambrian time through the oldest rocks of Antarctica, learning a little bit about how, in, how Antarctica was attached to Southwestern North America as part of an ancient, even more ancient than Pangaea, ancient supercontinent um, called Rodinia. Um, and how through much of the Precambrian, Antarctica as well as the entire world was lifeless, even out in the oceans. But, and this had to do with a lot with free oxygen not being available. Um, oxygen would become a lot more available once cyanobacteria, little microscopic photosynthesizing organisms, began to produce enough oxygen for more complex animals to evolve. And the cyanobacteria left behind trace fossils. They left behind stromatolites, which are found in the fossil record and also still found um, in Antarctica today. I, I gave an example in the lecture slides of how you still find stromatolites growing in some, some in some Antarctic lakes, um, which is really cool, I think. But we went on to Snowball Earth. Uh, we went to the Great Oxidation event, how the oxygen being added to the atmosphere um, caused there to be disequilibrium with the iron in the ocean, which um, when it oxidizes to rust becomes insoluble. So there was this period of oxygen levels rising and falling and that leading to alternating red and gray bands of ocean mud, periods when oxygen had built up and that caused the iron to, oxi to oxidize and fall out versus when the oxygen had gone down a bit. Um, that equilibrated eventually, just in time for Snowball Earth to happen, basically. And Snowball Earth was the event I talked about, the Earth's first ice age, essentially, when due to a combination of Milankovitch cycles, as well as probably the, the atmosphere still not being quite at the composition it is today, probably lower levels of CO2 because Earth was young and CO2 had not had as much of a chance to accumulate in the atmosphere, but Earth became entirely covered in glaciers for a while. So Antarctica, as well as the rest of the world was almost entirely covered in glaciers. The ocean wasn't completely frozen over, um, but something I that slipped me before was the term albedo and albedo 
refers to how lighter colored surfaces reflect more light and help keep the area around them cold. So in Antarctica today, the ice cap reflects sunlight and actually continues to help keep Antarctica cold. And during Snowball Earth, um, Snowball Earth was perpetuated in part by the fact that when the when Earth first got cold enough to form glaciers over much of the Earth, that began reflecting so much solar radiation back um, that it became cold enough on Earth for glaciers to form at the equator. And so glaciers at the equator mean that a lot of solar radiation is just being reflected back out to space. Earth was really cold during Snowball Earth. Um, and Snowball Earth came to an end because plate tectonics went on and volcanoes, um, volcanic eruptions began to occur. Um, the volcanic eruptions that began to occur um, put out CO2 that built up in the atmosphere over time and created more global warming through the greenhouse effect and gradually allowed Earth to melt again. And that's one reason why we haven't had a snowball Earth event since the amount of atmospheric CO2 has generally been better regulated since then. Um, because consider it early, early Earth volatility. Earth was a very volatile place early on. And I see there's a question about the dinosaurs in Antarctica, and we haven't quite gotten to those yet. Dinosaurs um, are relatively new organisms, all things considered. Um, Rodinia existed during Precambrian time, which is deep time, when we have fossils of hardly any organisms at all. We have the stromatolites um, from, the from the microscopic um, algae, the cyanobacteria. And then we have, I talked a little bit about how near the end of Precambrian time, after Snowball Earth, um, when the oxygen levels were starting to go up closer to what closer to what they are now, there was this little flash of biodiversity called the Ediacaran biota. They have not found those in Antarctica, but they there's just small fossils of weird jellyfish-like creatures that may not be jellyfish because they're not actually that clearly related to anything alive today. Um, but Rodinia was around well before the dinosaurs. Rodinia was around um, before and during Snowball Earth, way before the dinosaurs showed up. Um, so Pangea, Pangea existed, by the time Pangea existed, that's when dinosaurs were evolving. Pangea existed during the start of the dinosaur era and since then has been breaking up. Um, presently, we are living in the post-Pangea world, the world in which the continents have started to head away from Pangea. Um, but anyhow, so after Rodinia, after Snowball Earth, after this little brief burst of biodiversity in the Ediacaran biota, um, we begin the Paleozoic era of life, and at the start of that is the Cambrian explosion, which is not a mass death of life. It's actually when a whole bunch of different lineages that we recognize today, like arthropods, mollusks, the group that includes snails and clams and octopi, um, as well as different types of worms, like the polychite worms, um, fish ancestors, different types of corals, actual jellyfish. These groups all start showing up around the Cambrian period. Um, during the Cambrian explosion. So they show up rapidly and all at once. And that is, the Cambrian period is when oxygen levels actually began to approach modern day oxygen levels and much more complex life could evolve. So early Earth's history is kind of characterized by very little oxygen and not much complex life, but we get a lot more complex life when we have more oxygen. And that kind of brings me to a point that extremophiles, like the ones living in Blood Falls in Antarctica, like those ones living under the glacier and feeding off the rock and producing blood red iron water, um, they live in a pretty oxygen free environment. Um, and the only organisms very early on that could live like that were little bacteria like that. So complex life needs oxygen. Now, um, I kind of skipped over a lot of the Paleozoic, um, a lot of the Paleozoic era um, after the Cambrian explosion, it's kind of sea life, sea life, sea life. And there is some interesting information on Antarctic sea communities during the Devonian and the Ordovician, but I kind of skipped ahead from that to when Antarctica first became colonized on the land, when um, during the Carboniferous period, when um, there were starting to be many more land plants, not as many land animals just yet. There were some amphibians, but Antarctica was covered by the Carboniferous period in these swamps, these swamps of primitive plants that were the first plants to really be growing on land. Some conifers, but club mosses and horsetails and other, and ferns and tree ferns and other plants with spores. Um, and in these swampy conditions, the plants, there was so much plant growth that they would get buried before the plants could decay. And 
the buried hydrocarbons through geologic pressure became kind of purified into pure hydrocarbons essentially, and that is what coal is. And so there is coal in Antarctica from when Antarctica had these coal swamps, these steamy swamps um, in the Carboniferous period. And remember that the term Carboniferous actually comes from the fact that worldwide, not just in Antarctica, but in the Eastern US, in Siberia, there were coal swamps just covering everything. Um, and the coal swamps would end up giving way to the Permian period, the last period of the Paleozoic, the last period before the dinosaurs show up really, when Antarctica would cool again, actually, um, and when there would, for the when there would, for the first time since Snowball Earth, be an ice cap over Antarctica, and that's when Pangaea formed. Pangaea formed in the Permian period, um, before the dinosaurs were present. The Permian was was the land animals, which were the first major land animals to really be proliferant, to be kind of dominating land ecosystems. Like you have lots of land herbivores, lots of land predators. Those were the synapsids, which were the ancestors of us, the ancestors of the mammals. Um, the end of the Permian is characterized by a mass die-off of life, where um, massive volcanic eruptions um, caused coal in Siberia to be ignited. And the igniting coal released lots of CO2 that overwhelmed the oceans and caused ocean acidification and caused a mass die-off of marine life. And the ripple effects of that did heavily affect land and the volcanic eruptions did affect land life also not as bad but synapsids did not do well some of them survived they would survive to evolve into true mammals near the end of the triassic but dinosaurs um would evolve during the following triassic period which is the start of the mesozoic era or the dinosaur era and pangaea was still together at the start of the dinosaur era um pangaea was by that point largely a dry hot desert climate um, the glaciers disappeared by the time the dinosaurs evolved. And in general, during the dinosaur era, the Mesozoic era, the world was pretty darn warm. There were no glaciers present anywhere, including in Antarctica during the entire age of dinosaurs. And so dinosaurs show up during the Triassic period, um, during an evolutionary radiation of reptiles, um, kind of replacing the synapsids, which had declined. Um, I did linger on a few important synapsids, like I talked about how Lystrosaurus, that herbivorous synapsid that kind of looks like a hippo, was found both in Antarctica and in India and Southern Africa, and that helped prove the theory of continental drift and later the theory of, of plate tectonics. Um, Pangaea was together when the synapsid Lystrosaurus existed, um, when India and Australia and South America and Africa were all still joined. And the first dinosaurs are found in Antarctica in the early Jurassic, um, and we talked a little bit about the couple of Jurassic about the couple of Antarctic dinosaurs that have been found, and it kind of does a nice job of highlighting how Antarctica has very little rock exposed, and most of it's covered by glaciers. So they've found a handful of fossils um, in the peninsula where there's more exposed rock, as well as on some of the outlying islands. Um, and yes, Rodinia did ex Rodinia, I, I, it sounds like it existed right before it because we jumped through a lot, but Rodinia, Rodinia existed way back in time and then broke up again. And then the continents started to come together and formed Pangaea in the Permian. So yeah, it's, this is something that we linger on more when we're teaching like an earth history or dinosaurs class where we, more of the class's focus is supercontinents and earth history. Uh. Anyhow, um, I was jumping back just a second, but the, so, I, so Antarctic dinosaurs, not many of them have been found because there's not a lot of rock that's been exposed and not many of them have actually been described because a lot of the time the fossils they find are in poor condition. But dinosaurs thrived in Antarctica. There were, they found quite a few diverse types. And also since Antarctica was attached to Australia, the really interesting polar dinosaur community that lived in Australia when Australia was farther south, and still attached to Antarctica during the Cretaceous, um, when you had dinosaurs dealing with a warmer world, but one in which you still had thin polar light from the latitude, as well as as well as you had dinosaurs actually living south of the Antarctic Circle, south of the south of the line of longitude, excuse me, south of the line of latitude, um, below which you get you get total darkness for part of the year. There were dinosaurs living down there because there was enough food on land during the summer, and because some of them migrated away, some of them were warm blooded. Um, and just kind of lived out the winter eating eating roots and eating buried plants um, 
or some other creatures like the like the amphibians we talked about froze but there were some really interesting communities of dinosaurs living there um, but dinosaurs would decline from volcanic eruptions near the end of the Cretaceous period and then almost all of them besides birds would go extinct from the asteroid impact that that brought about the end of the Cretaceous period and the end of dinosaurs and created an open window for mammals like this lady here. And she says, I don't want to be part of your lecture, mom. But mammals, mammals which had evolved from synapsids near the end of the Triassic um, had kind of lived in opportunistic roles, basically doing what rats do, scavenging, eating rotting vegetation, eating, eating eggs, eating insects, um, or just nibbling on berries, but small, small nocturnal animals that didn't really occupy like large herbivore or large predator roles for the most part. But with dinosaurs mostly having been wiped out by um, the plant die-off caused by caused by the asteroid impact, many more mammal species survived because they were small and didn't need as much food a lot of the time and were also more opportunistic and could get by just eating eating all the dead dinosaurs to some extent. That's to some extent why people think mammals survived. Um, and in general, the animals that survived the extinction were small. The birds that survived were tiny and didn't need as much food either. But um, I went a little bit into the, the age of mammals and how horses evolved and showed up in Antarctica and how you had some interesting communities of Antarctic land mammals when mammals were first proliferating and there were a lot of types that we don't really recognize today, like Antarctodon, which is part of a group of plant-eating mammals that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and those mammals lived alongside early penguins. The penguins would survive, but the mammals would not. The penguins would survive because they had been, they had evolved flightlessness and evolved to live in the ocean, and the ocean would remain habitable. The ocean would continue to provide enough food for penguins and seals to survive, but when the Antarctic circumpolar current um, caused glaciers to cover almost all of the land, the land just became too inhospitable for most. Um, the land life mostly just didn't survive the opening of the Antarctic circumpolar current. And the Antarctic circumpolar current comes up a bunch of times. It's driven by a combination of the Coriolis effect driving the wind and by Ekman transport. The winds are coming, the winds coming from the other oceans, from the, the South Pacific, from the Indian, and from the South Atlantic, they are going north to south, and they are actually to some extent going to cause the water to move in a west to east direction then, which is to the left of the perspective of the wind because the wind is coming from the north. Um, the winds do get deflected also, like uh, they, the winds do get deflected into basically forming a west to east vortex around the continent, and this can occur because there's unbroken water. And I will say that there are actually a lot of complications as to how exactly the wind causes the current. Um, Ekman transport is geometrically really complicated, and I didn't really delve into much of why much of much of that. But the complicatedness of the wind water movement geometry is actually part of what causes the Southern Ocean to be so stormy. Um, and the um, and that's actually part of what causes the complicated patterns of upwelling and downwelling that you got off the, that you get off the coast, and that's something we barely touched on in lecture and that you delved into a little bit in lab. Um, but the current is important because it's fast and cold. It's one of the fastest currents to begin with, and it effectively blocks warm currents that might help bring heat to the land. It blocks those warm currents from actually getting anywhere near Antarctica. So Antarctica's glacier formation accelerated when this current was able to make a full loop around Antarctica in the Oligocene, which is in the middle of the age of mammals. So Antarctica is colder than the Arctic in part because of the circumpolar current. The Arctic doesn't, the Arctic, like Antarctica, is kept cold by its latitude and by the tilt of Earth's axis, causing causing the Arctic to be in total darkness during its winter. But it stays relatively warmer because it's an ocean. It's not land. You don't have the continental effect um, leading to really extreme cold temperatures in the interior as much. The ocean does kind of regulate the air temperatures a bit more. And there is no, there's not a current circling the Arctic systematically blocking warm currents. Warm currents don't easily get to the Arctic Ocean because it's kind of a closed off ocean surrounded by land. But the, there's not an equivalent to the Antarctic circumpolar current just blocking warm water quite as effectively. Um, so this 
a big takeaway from the circumpolar current is that it's a big reason why Antarctica is as cold as it is and why it's colder than the Arctic. I'm going to pause for questions because I just went over a lot. Does anyone have specific questions about geology or about earth history or, or about this or about anything else that they've been wanting to ask? This is more about the exam, but um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned like some of the dinosaurs, or not, they're not dinosaurs, but like the hippo creature that we like looked at. Um, yes. Yeah, that we looked at in class and like, um, will there be, will there also be like images on the exam too? Um, there is one question with a figure and I, I made sure to check with the TAs that it's visible this time. So that should not be an issue. Um, but, um, I not a lot of the not a lot of the questions have pictures. I did try to give I did try to write um, hints of sorts into some of the questions. So some of the questions mm -hmm. have have not not a super long, but like several sentences of intro, kind of to give you some context as to like when did you learn about this animal? Like why did we care about this animal? So I try to avoid just name dropping name dropping an animal and not giving you any context as to why it's important before asking you the question. So hopefully that should help a little bit with jogging your memory as to say like what Lystrosaurus was or what type of animal Cryolophosaurus was. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Could you um, briefly go over the geologic um, time scale of Earth? Because I kind of have a hard time like conceptualizing it still. I will. So it goes from Precambrian time to the Paleozoic, to the Mesozoic, to the Cenozoic. Precambrian time is so you can break it down much more than that. I had a I had a slide on that, but I'm not really having you memorize like the difference between epochs and periods and eras. It's helpful to know that eras like Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic are kind of broad and useful delineations. Paleozoic is often referred to as the age of fishes, but it's kind of like it's kind of like ancient life. It's when like you go from having all the fish and all the creatures show up at the Cambrian to having a bunch of weird mammal ancestors like Dimetrodon, like the sail-backed creature at the end of the Paleozoic, at the end of the Permian, then the big Permian extinction happens. Mass extinctions, there's a reason that, that the Paleozoic ends with a gigantic mass extinction. Um, and then the Mesozoic, which is the dinosaur era, also ends with a gigantic mass extinction that wipes out most dinosaurs and most of the other reptiles that were dominating the world. Um, and Mesozoic, one way to remember that is that it's the middle one. Meso, meso, Mesozoic kind of means middle life and Cenozoic means younger life. That's not as obvious from the root. Um, but um, the time scale is actually defined by patterns in the rocks and in the fossils. They define the, the boundary between the Paleozoic which and the Mesozoic by the Permian extinction, by the massive die off of a lot of ancient marine life as well as, as, well as a lot of the synapsids and other other land land fauna that were dominant at the time, um, and to a big extent, their subsequent replacement by by dinosaurs and other reptiles. And likewise, the the dinosaur extinction, the the asteroid extinction, is what defines the boundary between the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic is the age of mammals, which we're still living in today, um, and that boundary is to a large extent defined by the sudden disappearance of most dinosaurs, of pterosaurs, the flying ones, um, and of all the marine reptiles, as well as a lot of larger animals, and subsequently the radiation of the surviving birds and of mammals to fill those niches. Um, in terms of the dinosaur age, I do mention, so um, eras like Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic can be broken into periods. So the different, the different, the dinosaur era is broken into a couple little sort of smaller categories, like how you divide minutes into hours. So the sun, the Mesozoic is is um, broken into, into the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, which are the periods of time when dinosaurs lived in. Um, and funnily enough, those are actually also to some extent defined by ecological changes, not the extinction of dinosaurs, but the end of the Triassic is defined by when a bunch of a bunch of the other reptiles that showed up with the dinosaurs, like that evolved, kind of competing with them. The dinosaurs outcompeted most of them, and they all mostly went extinct. Um, like the Postosuchus, which was this crocodile creature I had a picture of um, in one of the Triassic slides. But there were a lot of animals like that that weren't dinosaurs, and those all went extinct. Um, and then at the end of the Jurassic, 
Um, dinosaurs survived overall, but there was a big change in which dinosaurs dominated at the end of the Jurassic. Um, and some of that has to do with instability caused by rifting. That's when Pangaea really started to break up, and that's what caused the um, big volcanic episode in Antarctica that produced the Ferrar basalts. Um, but does that kind of answer your question a bit and give you a little bit of a sense of how these different parts relate to each other? Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank okay. you. Yep, that's, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And feel free to let me know about that any other time. And I, I skipped over a lot. Um, the Cambrian period, it, the, it goes Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian. I skipped over everything between the Cambrian and, and the Carboniferous basically, because there's not a lot of specific Antarctica material in there. But you don't have to memorize that, but that's, those are the periods of, this, of the Paleozoic, which includes the Cambrian explosion and the Permian like the world of synapsids that existed before dinosaurs. Um, and this, anyway, the sun is, anyway, um, um, unless there's other questions about any of this material, I'm gonna move on to ecology and to like modern day ecology in just a moment. So I'll give people a moment to group any more questions they might have. Okay, so moving on to ecology. So terrestrial life in Antarctica largely went extinct after the ACC formed. You just left behind some arthropods like ticks, mites, um, midges, which are those wingless insects and springtails um, and tardigrades, some simple plants, mosses and lichens, which lichens aren't even technically plants, um, exactly two species of flowering plants and then extremophiles like the ones you get living in Lake Vostok or at Blood Falls or the ones feeding on the seal mummies out in the dry valleys. Um, but the marine food web is a lot more diverse. Um, the autotrophs, which are the organisms that photosynthesize and actually make their own food, are the phytoplankton that live in the water, the microscopic algae, as you'd call them. They're not quite plants, but they photosynthesize and they fulfill the same ecological role that grasses and trees and other plants do on land. And these microscopic algae actually spend the summer dormant, frozen in the sea ice or living under it in a lot of cases. And that's an interesting specific, um, that's, a, that's a case in which a fact of life in Antarctica, the presence of sea ice has kind of influenced the life cycles of the organisms that live there. And another example of that is how krill, the, um, the little crab-like organisms living in the water that, that whales eat, um, the larvae of the krill, the babies, spend the winter living under the ice and they can feed on this trapped algae to survive during the winter. So the sea ice kind of provides a nursery for them. But then in the summer, when some of this, when more of the sea ice melts, um, that releases the algae and the algae are then exposed to 24 hour daylight as well as an, ex as an excess of nutrients, both from the fact that you have nutrient rich water upwelling, as well as from the fact that during the winter, there wasn't any there wasn't any photosynthesis happening to use use those nutrients up and make food. Um, and so during the summer that causes a big productivity boom, a big boom in primary product productivity in which the phytoplankton proliferate and then the krill proliferate to eat them and baleen whales, the whales that have the hair growing in their mouth to help filter out the krill as well as crab eater seal, seals and various fish all begin to feast on the krill. And some of them migrate. The whales, for example, migrate specifically to Antarctica during the summer productivity boom, and then leave to raise their babies elsewhere during the winter when Antarctica doesn't have much food. Um, penguins and other seals feed on the fish that eat the krill. Um, and then leopard seals and orca feed on the penguins as well as some of the other seals. Um, although orcas and leopard seals do eat fish also. And I talked about how some of the fish in Antarctica have developed strange adaptations. Um, some like the ice fish having low hemoglobin and having no swim bladder aren't clearer outside of maybe serving a purpose for keeping them alive in the deep ocean, but they also have developed glycerol proteins that help keep their blood warm. Um, or they've become really large, polar gigantism, um, when fish or when um, ocean dwelling organisms become larger to deal with the cold surface, with the cold water um, is noted in Antarctica. And that's also actually something we see with penguins. Um, the largest penguins are the emperor penguins, which are the one species that breeds on the continent itself during the winter. Um, and the large size helps because large, the larger you get, the less your surface area, your surface area is going to also get larger, but 
less at, at a slower rate than your size is. So the bigger an organism, the small the 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 smaller the surface area to volume ratio is, and that means that they they fundamentally have less surface area compared to a smaller organism, and they lose heat less rapidly. Um, penguins don't just stay warm by being large, though. They also stay warm through a combination of behavioral adaptations like huddling and their tripod stance in which they have the front of their feet and the back of their feet and their stiff tail feathers touching the ice at different times so that they're not in contact with the ice as much. They've also adapted streamlined feathers, which help keep water as well as as well as wind off, and subcutaneous fat, this the fat underneath their feathers, underneath their skin that gives them extra insulation when they're in the water. And that's really similar to how whales and seals have adapted to keep warm in the ocean. They have blubber, they have fat that helps insulate them from the cold Southern Ocean water. And I talked about how there's some interesting adaptations in a lot of the marine mammals, like how baleen whales, like humpback whales, have evolved hair in their mouth. They have hair growing in their mouth instead of teeth, fundamentally. Um, baleen is made of the same substance, the keratin that makes up our fingernails and our hair. And they use that, that, that hair, that baleen, to filter out the krill. Um, I also talked about examples like how Waddell seals use echolocation to navigate in the water and how they also use their own internal magnetic compass and follow the Earth's magnetic field, how they retain oxygen well by having extra hemoglobin in the blood um, and also by storing oxygen in their muscles. So the first part of the lecture is more of kind of an ecological summary of trophic, level, trophic levels, ecological roles, and then the second part of the lecture delved a lot more into what types of roles the different Antarctic organisms, the marine organisms fill. And again, I spent a lot more time on the modern marine ecology because it's much more diverse. There is still a lot of productivity in the ocean from algae, but there's just not a lot of productivity on land because land plants cannot grow very well in Antarctica. Um, and so the ecological diversity on land is limited at the best. And that Summary was not exhaustive, but it will hopefully give you a sense of what sort of questions I might ask and what concepts are important. So good luck studying. And I am going to shut off the recording in the moment and just kind of open the floor for people to just um, to just ask the questions they want. So I'll be posting this as lecture nine. And once again, good luck studying.